the TCT Network brings you Rejoice. A connection of encouragement to build your faith and lift you to a new experience in God. Our program is specifically designed to bring you hope and the healing power of God through His Word and prayer. Now, here's today's Rejoice, hosted by Kathy Williams. Well, God bless you, and once again, we're so happy that you've taken the time to spend the next hour with us here on Rejoice. And we've got a powerful program in store for you today. I know your heart's going to be blessed. The presence of God is already here to meet the needs of His people. And this uh, very heart-wrenching story is going to bless your heart. I'll tell you who the guest is in just a moment, but I want to remind you that as this program progresses, we have prayer partners who are waiting now to talk with you, to pray with you, to, to take your knees to the throne of God, and as you can identify with the, uh, the, the story that our, our guest is going to share with us today, and you can feel the tug of God in your life, and you feel a need to give us a call and have someone pray with you, we're here to do that for you. And before the program leaves the air, we're going to be taking those needs to the throne of grace, knowing that God is going to meet your need because this program, I truly believe, was designed with you in mind. And my guest today with me is Jackie Carpenter, and she's author of The Bridge Between Cell Block A and A Miracle is Psalm 91. Let me say that again. The Bridge Between Cell Block A and A Miracle is Psalm 91. It's an amazing book, and Jackie shares the heart-wrenching story of the tragic event that changed her life and the lives of her family forever. In the middle of the night, she received a phone call. Her son had shot another man and had been arrested. How do you trust God through it all? Jackie is here to share her story. Jackie, welcome to Thank Rejoice. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. It is good to have you here. You know, this is a, this is a very, very a heart-wrenching story. It's a quick read, and it tells, and, and the, the, the actually, I can't think of a better title. The mm -hmm. title is perfect. No. The Bridge, mm -hmm. being Psalm 91. No. It was the bridge between Wives. cell block A yes. and a miracle. Mm -hmm. Let's start at the beginning. Okay. Tell us how this came to be. Let's do start at the beginning, because you know I'm not a writer, and I told you that earlier. I, I don't have a clue how to write a book. This book was written about two months following my youngest son Jason's murder trial. And it's interesting that you said that about the title because God gave me the title before he ever gave me the book. I was just sitting at my desk one day and he said, Jackie, what was the worst part of all of it? And I said, oh dear God, that was when Jason was in cell block A. And he said, what was the best? I said, well, that was when you showed up in the courtroom with our miracle. And he said, well, what was the bridge that joined really hell to heaven? And I said, oh, God, that was Psalm 91 that saved our life, that literally saved our life. So he said, now let's just start writing. And before I knew it, I had a book. And, you know, the bridge gives a full account of the tragedy that took place in our life, the murder trial that we went through, and the triumph that we experienced. And then when I thought I was through writing a book, I was just walking one day, and God spoke to me, Kathy, and he said, Jackie, okay, now you've told about this stuff, but what about the tears? Let's, let's mm -hmm. talk about that. Mm -hmm. And before I knew it, there was a second book, mm -hmm. Georgia Justice. Georgia Justice, Journey to Faith. That's it. That mm -hmm. book right there is what I experienced for 10 months. That's, mm -hmm. that's the journey the daily journey that I went through to struggle through something like what we were faced with. Because you see, Kathy, I have two sons. My oldest son is my pastor. My youngest son had been called to preach. This happened six months after he accepted God's call into the ministry. Mm. Is that not? I said the whole thing was just a vicious attack on Satan to shut him down. Well, now, ministry. before all of this happened, you were just a, a normal Christian oh, family yeah. living well, a happy life. Let's, let's Let me tell you, Kathy, I don't ever remember a time in my life that I was not in church. I was raised in church. I don't ever remember a time when I didn't know Jesus. But, you know, Georgia Justice tells, what do you do when all of a sudden your whole world is rocked mm -hmm. and your whole world is turned upside down and your faith is not turning you right side up? Mm -hmm. That's where I found myself, Kathy, because my faith had never been tried. Mm -hmm. I had a perfect life. I really felt like my life was perfect in the aspect that I, 
I had everything I wanted. My boys were both grown, happily married. I had four precious grandchildren. My husband and I traveled the world over. We just had an absolute perfect life. Mm -hmm. I did not realize how much worse it could get in just a matter of minutes. But what happened was my youngest son is a home builder. Mm -hmm. In Georgia, and I have learned it's not just in Georgia, he was a victim of numerous copper thefts. That is where robbers would go into his construction sites. They would tear out the copper, exposed copper. Sometimes it didn't have to be exposed. They would tear the walls out, you know, refrigerator lines, air conditioner lines. They would take this copper and sell it. Mm -hmm. Probably he wouldn't get over $50 for it, but yet... It was costing my son $6,000 to repair the damage done. Per, per construction? Per, per hit, yeah. Wow. And in the week of June 27th, he had already been hit three times in an underdevelopment he was building at the mm -hmm. time, construction site. He had eight houses going in a secluded area. And three times, during the week of June 27th, he'd been hit three times. But totaling, he had 17 robberies altogether. So wow. you can see in a downward economy how this was taking a toll financially. It was just horrible. But the sad part of it was, Kathy, he couldn't get any relief from it. And, you know, on the 27th of June of 08, after the third hit in this subdivision, a deputy met with my son to give him advice on what he could do to help, you know, but the advice he gave my son was bad advice, but we didn't know any different. A lot of the things he said was very true, that if my son didn't catch them himself, law enforcement did not have the manpower to guard his houses because you have to catch copper thieves in the act. Mm. And that means you've got to watch 24 hours a day, and they couldn't do that. But he went on to tell my son that if he would hide in the woods watch the next house mm -hmm. with exposed copper, that what he could do in turn is alert law enforcement. He was going to be doing this. He was only going to do it for three nights, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, because Monday he had already lined up a full-time security guy to watch all of his houses until he could get them far enough alone. But you got to remember, he'd already been hit three times, and he didn't think anybody was going to come back, and we sure didn't, or we would have been with him. But... You know, he went on to tell my son, I will alert law enforcement that you're doing this. And Jason, all you have to do is, if they do show up, call 911. They will be aware of this. Mm -hmm. The police will be there in, in a matter of just minutes. Mm -hmm. So I didn't like the idea. But, you know, Jason is a perfectionist. He went on to ask them many questions about this. What if they, what if they do this? What if they do that? And he said, well, Jason, you can lawfully do what is called make a citizen's arrest. Mm -hmm. You are allowed to hold them at gunpoint. You are allowed to bind their hands and feet, and that is called making a citizen's arrest. And this and is then, what the deputy told him? The deputy's advice. But, you know, nobody thought it would ever come to that. The most Jason was going to do was sit in the woods and watch. Right. You know. Because the police would show up immediately. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And, you know, so that's what was happening. You know, that, that night, that Friday night, he went out there. I talked to him at 10, 12, 12 minutes after 10 p.m., I called my son, and I said, baby, what are you doing? And he said, Mom, I'm out here watching these houses. I begged him, please go home, because I didn't feel good about it. He said, Mama, they're not going to come back tonight, you know. And he said, I only have to do this for a few nights, and then I'll have full-time security. And I started praying, Kathy. But, you know, God assured me that my son was not alone, that he was out there with him. I had total peace about it at that point. I went on home, and... Um, <laughs> At 2 o'clock in the morning, our phone rang. It was my dad calling, and my husband answered, and I, I knew something was wrong. You know, when you get a call at 2 in the morning, you know something's wrong. Mm -hmm. But when I heard my husband saying, oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, you need to talk to Jackie, he said, it's your dad. And I thought, oh, God, oh, God. You know, you start panicking, and I said, Daddy, what? He said, Jackie, Jason was out there, which I knew he was. He said, and they did show back up. And he said, 
Jason was trying to tie, tie him up or something, but that gun misfired and it shot one of them. And Billy, who was his father in law, was on the way to the hospital. And I'm thinking, none of this makes sense. Jason's supposed to be in the woods. He's supposed to be calling. The police are supposed to be doing this. And what's Billy, his father in law, doing it? Nothing was making sense, right, Kathy. Right. But he did say that they were, Billy was en route to the hospital. So, you know, I moved into the living room. And and I had the phone in my hand, and we had started our circle of calling everybody. I was calling Jason's wife. I was calling Jim. You know, have you heard anything? Have you heard anything? My dad, have you heard anything? And I must have dozed off to sleep, you know, because at about 7, the phone rang again. And when I answered it, it was my daughter-in-law, Stephanie, and she was screaming, and she was crying. And I could hardly make sense out of what she was saying. And she was saying, Miss Jackie, Miss Jackie, the man died. That man died, and they've arrested Jason, and they've taken him to prison, and they may charge my daddy also, and they've charged him with murder. And mm. my whole world... Our whole world had just all of a sudden fallen apart, it's Kathy. Crumbled. It was crumbling around us. And, you know, when that happens, life, you start living life in a blur. And when people are talking to you, a lot of this is in Georgia Justice. When people are talking to you, you can't concentrate on what they're saying. You can't focus. All you can focus on is where my son is at and get me to him. So we got up. My husband and I, we drove two hours. It took us two hours to get to Jason's house. And we were sitting around his kitchen table, and Billy, the father-in-law, was there. Had your daughter come home from... But my daughter-in-law was there. We were all around the table, but Jason was missing. And we got, the, we got an attorney. The only attorney we could get, we didn't have an attorney. So my dad got out of bed around 6 a.m., and he ran, and he got Jason's real estate attorney who handled the closings of the houses. That was the only attorney we had. And he was also a good friend of ours and Jason's friend. He came. He met us at 10 o'clock. Kathy, I knew when I saw his face, I didn't want to hear what he had to say. I just knew when I saw Ron's face, I did not want to hear what he had to say. I knew it was not going to be good. And he sat down with the family. We were all in a circle. And he said, I just looked at him and I said, where's Jason? He said, Jackie... He's in, he's in jail. And I said, Ron, why? And he said, Jackie. Now, he said, he said, I can't get him out yet. I said, why not? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we just can't. I said, Ron, what is going on here? He said, Jackie, let me tell you what happened. He said, while Jason was down there guarding the houses, they came back. And he said, when he called 911, mm -hmm. There were no backup. There were no police because this young deputy never alerted law enforcement that my son was going to be doing this. He never alerted anyone. So Jason didn't know that. And after he called 911, he called his father-in-law, Billy, who lives 10 minutes away, who also knew he was out there, who was concerned about what was going on, too. And when he called Billy, Billy said, Jason, do you need me to come over there? And Jason said, I'm so scared. So Billy said, well, I'm coming over there. Jason's in the woods now. So Billy comes over there and pulls up behind this van. It's a white van. While my son was sitting out there at 1 o'clock in the morning, they came back. And when they pulled into this house, they turned so their headlights were right on my son in the woods. And it scared him so bad. And he fell off and he called 911. And then he called Billy. But what happened was, not knowing there were no law enforcement backing him up, when Billy got there, he got out of his truck, and he started approaching this van. It was 1 o'clock in the morning. It was pitch black. The only light was Billy's flashlight. He doesn't own a gun. So when he approached the driver's side of the van, Jason's watching this from the woods. And he can't just sit there, Kathy, because the father-in-law is walking up to this window. So he comes out. He has a double-barrel shotgun, an old gun. He had never used it. It had been on a shelf. He fired a warning shot in the air so they wouldn't hurt the father-in-law. Mm -hmm. He then approached the other side of the van. They opened the doors and started ordering the men out. The two up front were totally cooperative, Kathy. They did it. They got out. Jason was explaining to them, I don't want to hurt you. The police are on their way. They should have already been here. But he was going on to the next part of this plan, the deputy told him, was the citizen's arrest part. He, he was told he could have a, a gun, and he fired a warning shot. 
But the two up front got out, and they were going to lay down so he could tie their hands and feet, but he could still see shadows in the back of that van. He knew there were more in there. Mm. So he started telling the others, please come out. Come out. I don't want to hurt you. Finally, a third man came out and still didn't know if there were more. But the third man was totally rebellious. And even though Jason tried to explain to him, I don't want to hurt you, he was very rebellious. And he, ran, he went over and he laid down on the other side of these two that were already laying down. And Billy was standing in front of him with his flashlight on him. And Jason went back over and laid the gun down and he was trying to tie the first man. When he could see the third man, the rebellious man, he was getting up, Kathy. He was either going for a knife or gun, a weapon. The only thing Jason knew for sure is he was going for the father-in-law. So Jason grabbed the gun back up. He ran back over to him, finger nowhere near the trigger. He used the gun to just push him down like a stick, like something to push him down. But when he did, it fired. Mm -hmm. Now, not that this matters because it was an accident, but what we did find out later was because the first shell had been shot, the second one had dropped into the chamber, the gun had a hair trigger. They said with either the slightest brush against it, it would have caused the gun to fire. Who knew? Who knew? He just used it to push him down, but it fired, and it shot him right here. And at that point, Jason calls again for 911. And they start telling him the police are on their way. And he said, no, no, no. I need an ambulance. There were either two to three calls to 911. The police, when they did get the call, were on the other side of town. They got lost en route. Look, by the time the actual police got here, mm -hmm. everything was over. The ambulance, by the time it got there, everything was over. Let me tell you, they started trying to save this man that had been shot, Jason, Billy, the 911 operator. When they saw the man was bleeding to death, Jason and Billy got him up, put him in Billy's truck, and he started to the hospital. He met the ambulance, but he couldn't get it to stop. So he went on to the hospital where, in the early morning hours, the man passed away. Now, what happened if all of this tragedy is not enough? If all of this is not enough, when the deputy who gave my son this advice in the early morning hours found out what had happened at this site. He went to the judge in the early morning hours before we could ever get an attorney there. This is what Ron is starting to tell us now. And Ron is the attorney. He's the attorney but, sitting here with us. Mm -hmm. He said, Jackie, before I could get up there, this deputy had already been up there, and he told the judge that he did meet Jason at the construction site, but he never told Jason to hide in the woods. He never told him that he could uh, make a citizen's arrest. All of this, he never said. He said that he met Jason. Jason was in a rage about the robberies, and he just wanted to kill somebody. Mm. Not only that, within the next hours, before we could even get into cell block A to see my son, <laughs> the deputy had gotten the other two alleged copper thieves, took them back down to the construction site with Fox 5 news cameras, mm. and they were telling the world that my son had executed their cousin. Now, now who were these men? Let me tell you, they were three illegal Hispanics who we didn't know who they were. Were they working at the they, site? They, they or said they were. To be working at they the said site. they were. But Jason had been to the site every day, even that day. And he said he had never, ever laid eyes on these three men. And, and he hadn't. I know that now. But he said he did not recognize them. He had no clue who they were. And he didn't because their boss was dealing with the guy who was over Jason's project. And they were new people that he was going to send in to work down there. So Jason did not know who they were. But, you know, it, none of it was making any sense. But the part that hurt the family worse than anything is the way the newspapers picked up on what these And I'm thinking, Kathy, maybe the rebellious guy was so rebellious because he was illegal. And when Jason said the police are on the way, mm -hmm. it scared him. Hmm. It could have scared him, and he panicked, and he was going to try to make a run. Nobody will ever know that at this point. Nobody will hmm. ever know that. But 
You know, what happened was the newspapers started reporting the story, and the TV started reporting the story, and they were putting us under gag orders, and we couldn't say a word to anybody. So they just had the one side of the story. And boy, did they start running that with it. They just ran with it. And what happened after that, it was being portrayed as the gospel. See, mm. that was being portrayed as the truth, the absolute truth. And what happened was the blockers started keying in now. And they were voicing their opinions, and they started feeding off each other. So you were online. You could read some of what was... Oh, and, in the uh, newspapers, did you didn't even have to be feel? online. All you had to do was go pick up a newspaper, and you could see it all in the blogging section of the newspapers. Oh. And, you know, finally, the attorney tried to stop that because they were putting my son in so much danger, and his wife and his little six-year-old boy. And because, I mean, Kathy, it was bad. Did you read some of the blogs? Oh, oh, I did to a point it was just destroying me so bad. Because see what was happening now. We were, my son was in cell block A. And we finally got in to see him. And when we did, it was me, my husband, and my daughter-in-law. And I'd never been to the jail. I didn't know what to expect. My son had been interrogated all night. Well, mm -hmm. they finally mm -hmm. call us in, and I realized they put my son in cell block A. That is the worst place that they can put your child, because that's where all the murderers are. Mm. And they have to wear the red and white stripes. And when they brought my son in, oh, Kathy, I had to look at him through a glass. And when I looked at him, it was almost like I couldn't recognize him because he'd been through so much. And he was crying, and, and he was telling us, Mama, it was an accident. It was all an accident, you know. It was all an accident. And we had to try to stay strong for him, you know. And we had to try to keep him alive in there. We didn't know how long he was going to be there. And so after the fourth day in there, we have a preliminary hearing. And, you know, our hopes are up. We're going to bring him home today. We're going to bring him home. And Ron, you know, was still our attorney. We still didn't have a, he, we still had a real estate attorney. And we, we kept thinking, well, we're going to get him out today. And then we can start worrying about everything else. We'll just get him out. Well, why did you think you were going to be able to get him out? Well, because we thought that after the preliminary hearing, they were going to realize this thing was an accident. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we could prove it was an accident. And then it would be over. And we'd just deal with everything else. Right. Okay. We got in there for the preliminary hearing. And it was so bad. It was so bad. How was his wife holding up oh, at this point? She, up until this point, she was terrible. But this day, she was good. And I was good because we were going to take him home with us. Mm, and we so were good. We were full of hope. And we, we walked into that courtroom. And when we looked down there, we saw him. He looked, and he was so hopeful. And he turned around, and he didn't have the, the red and white on anymore. He had on his clothes. And, and he was sitting down there. And he turned around, and he smiled at us. He smiled. And... And we were so optimistic that, oh, God, when we leave here, we're going to have him. Thank you, Jesus. And so we started this preliminary hearing. I didn't like what I was hearing, Kathy. I didn't like it at all. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, because the lead investigator was on the stand, and all he had was the deputy's report. Mm -hmm. This whole thing was on the deputy's report. And on the deputy's report, he didn't say anything about... Uh, citizens arrest and he didn't say anything about telling Jason to hide in the woods and he'd have uh, have police in the area he had written up everything he told the judge he never told my son that my son was in a rage and the next thing I knew the judge was saying the charges will stand you will be charged accordingly and when my son stood up they were putting handcuffs on him and when I saw him walking out, I could see he had shackles on his feet. And I didn't realize that when he was sitting at that table smiling. And when he started walking out, he could hardly walk. And I realized his feet were shackled. Oh. And when I got up and I walked out of the courtroom, Stephanie had fainted, his wife. She'd fainted. And she was laying on the, outside the courtroom on the floor. Oh and I stepped over her. And I had no clue she'd fainted. I had no clue I stepped over her. Mm. The next thing I knew, I'd walked into this big post, and I, I didn't even really know where I was at. And I walked on out the door, and I saw a bench, and I knew I just had to sit down. And my husband had left me, and he had gone to get the car, and that's why he wasn't with me through any of this. 
and he was driving up to the front of where I was sitting, getting me into the car. And when we got home, I had not taken any calls from anybody, but it was my Sunday school teacher's husband. And the reason I took his call is because he had witnessed a miracle with his own wife, my Sunday school teacher, where she literally came back from the day as she was dying. And he said, Jackie, listen to me, because I couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't talk, period. He said, just listen to me. He said, I want you to get into your prayer closet, and I want you to move your life into Psalms. Mm -hmm. He said, that's how I survived what I went through. And he said, that's how I got my miracle. I want you to do the same thing. So I did. I moved my life into Psalms, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And so what I did was, okay, God, if you're not going to fix this, if you're going to make him stay in there, I'm going to start fixing it. I'm going to find the answer. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fix it myself. We'll try to find ways. We I'll will. do it. Mm -hmm. I'll take care of this thing. I mm -hmm. thought I could trust you to do this. I thought you would. Why, why is this happening? I mean, because why is this happening? On so many fronts, it could have been stopped, okay? And you feel Number that way one, when, you, when you've, you've been faithful to God. You feel why? that you've been, why? You've been why? A, yes, a good Christian all your life. Why? 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 I mean... Number one, the deputy didn't have to give my son bad advice. Number two, the police didn't have to get lost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Number three, the father-in-law didn't have to arrive before the police. Number four, the man didn't have to be rebellious. Number five, the gun didn't have to misfire. Number six, he didn't have to die. Number seven, the man didn't have to die. Eight, he didn't have to go lie about it. Mm -hmm. On so many fronts. Yes. Why? Why? You know, so what I did, I did probably like every mother or 99% of them would do. I started trying to find an answer, another answer. I started researching 25 hours a day, Kathy. I woke up to research. I went to bed to research, searching laws, searching everything. I thought, okay, if they're going to base all of this on a lie, then we've got to start trying to figure out how to combat a lie. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we've got to start finding another way other than the truth because the truth is not going to work. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. It didn't work in the preliminary hearing. And not only that, they didn't charge him with just felony murder. They charged him with felony murder, three counts of aggravated assault and possession of a firearm. Four of them would have sent him to prison many years. The mm -hmm. one, you know what I'm learning now, could have even been a death, a death charge. Oh my. I learned that with Casey Anthony because she was also charged with felony murder, and I did not realize a felony murder charge could bring a death penalty with it. Oh. Had I known that, I probably wouldn't be alive sitting here talking to you because yeah. I don't know that I could have even, oh, I don't know about that one. The others were so hard. Oh. But what happened was, in the process of trying to find, literally trying to find an answer myself, I was wearing my physical body down, mm -hmm. and I ended up in a hospital in a hospital bed getting a blood transfusion. But I know now, because hindsight's 2020, that that's where God had to get me, mm -hmm. to get me out of the computer, to get me out of research books, to get, you to out get of me his flat world. on my back. Yes, so that he can do it. So that I would be still mm -hmm. and know that he is God. Amen. And listen, mm -hmm. and listen. I wasn't listening to God anymore. Mm. I listened to him I listened to him up until after the preliminary hearing. Then I didn't want to hear what he had to say anymore because it wasn't working. Mm. So I loved him. Yeah, I loved uh, Yeah, I loved him. But I just realized I couldn't depend on him for this. I had to do something myself. So what happened while you were in the hospital? When I was in the hospital, I couldn't do anything else. So I had to listen to God. I just had to listen to him tell me, you know, you're searching the wrong books. Oh, <laughs> wow. You're searching wow. the wrong book, Jackie. Why don't you go back and listen to what your Sunday school teacher's husband told you? He, he put you on the right path, you know. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you how God confirmed this. When I got out of the hospital, I had to go to CVS Pharmacy to get all my medications. And right there on the choice book stand, my eyes, Kathy, was just drawn to it, was a book by Peggy Joyce Ruth, Psalm 91, God's Shield of Protection for Your Life. I grabbed it, and I took it home, and I went back into my prayer closet, because I have a prayer closet. I literally have a prayer closet, but it's my sauna that I've converted to a prayer closet. I have my Bible notes everywhere, my books. <laughs> I had research books, but th those books are gone, because I realized man didn't have the answer. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. What do you do when you realize that money's not enough, 
It's not going to buy you anything. It's not going to buy anything. It ha it's, it's useless. And innocence is not enough. Mm -hmm. And man doesn't have the answer. You got to right. go somewhere, Kathy. You have to. You got to go somewhere. Okay, so what I did, I moved into this book of Psalm 91, and I started reading about miracle after miracle of situations where there was no way out. Mm -hmm. But I saw in each one how God had intervened. Mm -hmm. So you know what I did? I started claiming... Look, we're literally now six months into this thing, okay? Because, yes, it, we're about six months in. Well, one thing we missed, um, at the arraignment, mm -hmm. and you say they took him away, so they denied bail? Oh, listen. My son had been in cell block A uh, for nine days. <laughs> nine days, 91. Nine days, that just occurred to me. And, look, our real estate attorney wasn't enough anymore. Mm -hmm. So we went out and we took our money. And we bought the best defense attorney that money could buy in, in our town, mm -hmm. in, in Georgia, in our town. And we were told he was the best. And I look, at the, look back at it now, and I'm sure he was the best because that man was brilliant. Mm -hmm. He was the best. But um, he set it up after Jason was in there for nine days that we could go back for a bond hearing. Mm -hmm. And so we went in for the bond hearing, and yes, he was able to get my son out on bond okay. under the stipulation that he had no contact at all with his father-in-law. Um, they could not see, talk, or anything. Well, no, was the father-in-law charged? Char no. He was never charged with anything. Okay. No, no he wasn't. Uh, but he couldn't have any contact with him at all. And, uh, you know, all the other requirements for Bond. So Jason was now out, mm -hmm. back with his family. Life was <laughs> our new norm. And our new normal, and this is in Georgia justice, our new way of normal is um, we go on about life the way we were going on about it. I go to work, we go to church, but you're never there. I know. You're I know. not there. Mm. You're just not anywhere you go. You're not there. Mm. I remember in Georgia Justice, I told my husband one day, let's go to the mall. Let's just, let's just get away from all this and go to the mall. We did, but I wasn't there. Mm. The whole time I'm at the mall, I'm looking around at everybody, wondering, is anybody hurting like I'm hurting? Are all these people happy? Are they mm. just going about their lives? Mm. Is everything good? Do they feel what I'm feeling? Is anybody in this world feeling what I'm feeling? Where well, I went into the bathroom and started having a meltdown and just a panic attack in the bathroom at the mall. And I realized that it was at that very time that my son, I knew his arraignment was that morning. Not arraignment is where you go before a jury and they decide whether or not they have enough evidence to carry you on for a trial. Mm -hmm. And the, and the attorney had done said, Jason, they're going to find you. Because the preliminary hearing you were charged, they're going to find you too. But at that point, my son was only charged with felony murder. Mm -hmm. But this was the arraignment. And that's where they would decide exactly what he'd be charged for. Mm -hmm. So how did I know that while I'm in the bathroom at the mall having a meltdown, it's when the jury and I was saying my son's going to be charged with five counts. Because I, I ran out of the bathroom, and I said, we need to go. And I found my husband. I said, let's just go. This is just not working. This mall thing's just not working. And I started crying, you know, and my little ball in the car, which is, you know how you just get up in a little ball, and you can't do mm -hmm. anything but cry. You just cry all the time. The, the only thing you have a lot of are tears. They never stop, you know. At one point, you think you'd run empty. But you don't run empty. <laughs> Your tears, you know. And God would show me the verses about, hold on, my child, you know. Uh, weeping only lasts for the night. Joy yes. comes in the morning, you know. And just the weeping will pass. The weeping will pass. But, you know, that was the new normal for me. Waking up in the middle of the night um, with panic attacks, you know, shallow breathing, palms sweaty, can't breathe, just trying to fall down beside my bed, you know. Not asking for strength to get through this, just asking for strength to get me to my prayer closet. Mm. Where once I could get to my prayer closet, I could hook back up to Psalm 91, which was my life support. Mm -hmm. And when I could hook back up to my life support, see, God would be telling me, this is going to be okay. I'm putting angels in charge of you. You don't have to be a worry. You don't have to be afraid of that fear that comes by night, those arrows that come by day. You, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this thing right. Praise you know, God. here's the difference in what man tells you and what God tells you. Man would tell us when we come out of our prayer, when I come out of my prayer closet and go to these meetings with attorneys, 
man would look at me and say, Jackie, wake up. Come out of this world you're living in where you're saying you're going to get a miracle and God's going to make this thing. Wake up. It's not, it's not whether or not he's going for how long. It's for how long. It's not whether he's going or not to jail. It's for how long he's going for. And that's what you need to start concentrating on. I never could go there. Mm. I couldn't get past, is he going or not? Because God tells me he's not. Mm -hmm. Satan tells me he is. Mm -hmm. And see, I well, was now, in a battle. Well, now, he was given an opportunity to, to uh, plea bargain. Oh, you want to hear about the plea? Oh, please. Oh, too. I kept praying, God, let us plea. God, please give us a plea bargain. Please don't let us go to prison. Please, please don't let us go, you know, before a murder trial. Please don't do this. And here was our plea. <laughs> Jason called me once again, from the, and he just got out of the attorney's office, and I never liked what the attorneys had to say. They, they didn't want me coming to their offices, number one, because I just I couldn't accept what they were saying, and I kept questioning them about everything. They didn't want to be questioned like I was questioning them, you know. Mm -hmm. I took my big notebook <laughs> where I did all my research mm -hmm. prior, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, they didn't want that, you know. They didn't want that. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> so now I'm, I, I'm forgetting the research books. Now I got my Bible, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know. And I said, At one God point, they didn't want you bringing it. Well, oh, I don't want to get ahead. Way. I don't want to get ahead. Let's keep. Let's go back to the plea bargain. Let's, plea, yeah, let's go the back plea. to the plea bargain. Oh yeah, the attorney called my son. He said, "Well, you know, I just met with uh, the prosecutor, and what they're saying is they will plea." Uh, he's also met with the uh, judge, the judge and the prosecutor, and they said, "What the judge is saying, Jason, is he does not want this case in his courtroom." And the reason being is because of all this deputy's actions. The deputy taking the two alleged copper thieves back down to the site with Fox 5 News was mm, bad. Mm. He was not supposed to do that. He lost his job for that. Mm. That was a no-no. The police department, no. A lot of things came up that did not, the judge didn't want, the sheriff did not want it coming. The sheriff tried to help us all he could with this thing. Mm -hmm. he, everybody knew it was an accident, okay? Mm. Everybody knew it was an accident. The prosecutor knew it was an accident. But you know what he's saying? I'm going to make an example out of that boy. Because if I don't, all the builders out there, because of all the copper theft that's going on, they're going to be taking the law into their own hands, just like he took it into his own hands, and we can't have that. But look, my son didn't want to take the law into his own hands. He was advised that that was his only choice. Mm -hmm. But that all went. That, mm. So what the judge is saying is, tell him to come before me. I want to try him. And won't go to a jury trial, and he will get a fair trial with me. But what this equals out to is let him come before me. I'm going to find him guilty. Yes, mm -hmm. because I've got to. I can't let a murderer go free. That mm -hmm. will cause chaos if mm -hmm. there's not enough already. But he will only get anywhere from three to five years. Wow. Now, how's that one for you, Kathy? So they had to Three make a to decision. Three to five years, where they had already said and told us in an attorney's office that my son would never survive prison because he would, he would be sent to where the murderers all are and that my son, because he's never been in that atmosphere and lived that type of life, he would never survive inside that. So what they wanted to try and do is let my son plead to this and try to get him in a uh, work camp, a prison and work camp where uh, he would be out there with more civilized, more, more people that wouldn't hurt him, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that type. Less hardened know. criminals. That's it. Mm -hmm. I, couldn't, I couldn't even go there, Kathy. I could not even comprehend any of this. But everybody's telling my son to take that plea. Because if they don't, the his alternative is go before a jury trial and the judge, that same judge is saying, tell him if he don't do what I'm telling him that if the jury even finds him guilty of a misdemeanor, mm. I'm going to send him to prison for the max. Wow. Because I don't want it in my courtroom. So everything changed at that point. I went back into my prayer closet, you know, and I started praying, what do we do, God? But it wasn't my decision to make. It was Jason's. Mm -hmm. And, and he wife. did the right thing. Jason and Stephanie, they went to church that Sunday, and they went to the altar, and they prayed over it, and they prayed over it. And he called me back. Um, that afternoon, and he said, Mama, I, I can't get any peace. We're going before that judge. He's just going to look at me as another case number. He's going to tell me how long I'm going for, and then he's going to call the next case up. He said, Mama, I, God only gave me peace for the jury trial. Mm -hmm. Oh, everybody started panicking. Jason, don't do this. Don't do this. Please don't do this. But I knew he had to do what God was telling him mm -hmm. because I was having to do what God was telling me because, see, I'm hooked up.
I, me and God are hooked up now, you know. God's telling me <laughs> You're on I the right can track. take a, God's telling me <laughs> I can take the devices of the wicked and make them to non effect. Yes. I can take the crooked way and I can make it straight. Praise God. Put not your trust in man, for I am your defense. Mm -hmm. See, God gave me the right answers. Mm -hmm. God gave me the stuff that was keeping me alive. It was when I stepped out of that out of that prayer closet that I was bombarded with man and man's ideas and man's views, everything trying to bring me down. Because, right. see, there's a battle going on. Well, Jackie, let me say, for those of you who are just tuning in, I have with me today uh, Jackie Carpenter. She's written a beautiful book, The Bridge Between Cell Block A and the Miracle is Psalm 91, filled with her experience and what she's sharing with us today. Her website is coming up on the screen. If you want to get this book, learn more about Jackie. And also another book, her sequel is Georgia Justice, Journey to Faith. Uh, you'll be able to get that one, too. The website is there. I just want to give you an opportunity to take down that information so you can learn more about this story, read exactly what she felt, and be blessed of God the more. So I wanted to get that in for you, Jackie. You. But let's, let's go back now. Um, he made the decision that he's going to go before he a jury. And so then he knows now he, there's a 50-50 a chance in his mind that, okay, at best. at best. Because when he went by to tell the attorney, his, his defense attorney, I've decided not to take the plea. Mm -hmm. The attorney was writing something when he walked in, and he said, I just wanted to stop by here to tell you, I've decided I don't want to take the plea. I want to go on to a trial. The attorney just threw his pencil down, and he looked at my son and said, you have made a huge mistake. Mm. That's when you have to know that God is on your side. See what I'm saying? You have, your faith, if your faith is not know. there, if it is not there, you know, but, you know, you keep thinking, this is not going to happen. Surely to goodness, somewhere along the way, truth is going to emerge, mm -hmm. and we're not going to go to a murder trial. You just, you just keep thinking that, but, you know, we get right on up till the weekend before a murder trial starts, and it's Easter Sunday. And I'm going to have everyone over, you know, for lunch. And I got to tell you, Kathy, it was like our last supper. It was like, is this going to be the last time for 30 years or more that we can all sit down as a family? Is this going to be it for our family? And, you know, my cousin called me early that morning, and the headlines read, Veach murder trial starts tomorrow. You know, it's there. You don't get away from any of this stuff. It's mm -hmm. always there. You, there's no escaping it outside of your prayer closet. Mm -hmm. There's no escaping and I just fell down beside my bed, and I started praying, Dear God in heaven. And I knew Jason was terrified because the uh, defense attorney told Jason that 90% of this case was going to rest on his shoulder, on his testimony. Mm -hmm. And that was so much pressure because he knew what kind of prosecutor he was going to be up against. And he was scared. He was literally scared to death. And I just fell down beside my bed. And I started praying. I had my Bible, and I said, God, give me something to give this child today when he comes over here that will assure him, that will, that will give him confidence, that he will know that you're going to be right there with him. And I just flipped open my Bible, and I just started reading it. And I believe it was like Isaiah 51, 15, or 16 that says, put not your thought in what you're going to say, that I will put my words in thy mouth, mm. and I will cover thee under the shadow of my hand. Mm. And I just ripped it out. And when he come over that day, I folded it up, and I said, take this with you. Just take this on home with you, because God wants you to have it. What was his demeanor like at this point, knowing now that Jason's he's going to Jason's demeanor try? was always good. Jason's, Jason's faith is what kept me going when my faith was shattered, because we had to go get his truck down there at that site. After this happened, we had to go get his truck, and... When my husband cranked it up, he had a CD of a preacher in there preaching a message. And when I looked over his seat, all I could see was gospel tapes and gospel CDs. And when I had to literally go into his home with the lead investigator before they would issue his bond, we went into his office, and I saw all of his Bible, Bible study notes where he taught Bible school on the walls. And I saw a picture of his little six-year-old boy praying as a picture on his desk. And I saw the look in this lead investigator's eyes like, Something's not adding up to what I've been told about this guy. Something's not right here. Mm -hmm. I see all of this, mm -hmm. and it doesn't add up to all the things that they say he said and, right. and the foul language that he yes, used, and yes. things just don't add up to this. Because, see, 
these are things nobody had time to go in and plant. Mm -hmm. This is it. What you see is my son. Mm -hmm. And when I was in there and I see this, my faith was renewed when it was shattered. My faith was renewed mm -hmm. to say, thank God, thank God. This is, this who is my Jason son. Is. Yes. This is him. Yes. You know? Yes. So Jason's faith was always strong. But Jason's faith that God was going to intervene with a miracle wasn't where mine was out. Mm. Jason had done started preparing his life either way. Mm. He had done started trying to prepare being away mm. uh, from us. How was his son doing at this time? Oh, he changed forever. That little boy, six-year-old boy, you know, you try to shelter them, you try to hide them, but you can't. You can't hide them from everything because... They're, he's part of our life, and he right. sees, you know. That little boy would spend every Friday night with me. Up, up until this happened, Friday night was his night with me, and he was with his, he calls me Gummy, Grandmommy Gummy. Mm -hmm. He would stay with me every single Friday night. Me and him would lay in bed, and we'd talk about everything in the world and, and everything. And after this happened, he hasn't stayed with me. Mm. It changed him. You know, he'll never get over this either. But I do say, he, he was in a Christian school, and he had a lot of support around him. His teachers, oh, they ministered to him. He was in a good church. He was under, he was under the Bible all the time. Thank God. So God, oh, Thank yes. He, he, yeah. It's yet to be seen what God's going to use from this to do in that child's life when he's grown. You know, it's, oh. it's yet to be seen. Okay, Jackie, oh, there's so much to talk about. Um, once again, if you want those books, we want you to get them. But now let's go to the trial. The trial. Okay, you're in the trial. The, the prosecutor is calling his witnesses. Mm -hmm. Monday morning, we wake up, and it's the day to go to trial. But I didn't even want to get out of bed and go anywhere, Kathy. Mm -hmm. I literally started thinking, no, 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 Saturday, back up to Saturday, when I got like, my last advice before the attorneys, which was, tell your mama. Tell your mm -hmm. mama. Mm -hmm. She can come to court Monday, but... Do not bring that Bible. That's what I want you to talk about. Do not bring it. Mm. When Jason come by to tell me and that... And why didn't they want you to bring the Bible? When Jason come by to tell me that, I said, Jason, I have to. As my life support, I can't live outside of it. I can't live in this world outside of my hookup here. He said, Mama, they are so afraid that if there is an atheist or an unbeliever on the jury, if they see your Bible, they could take that unbelief, make an opinion against that Bible to me, and their unbelief and seeing your Bible could form their opinion that I'm guilty just to send me on. Mm -hmm. But yet, what if there were six unbelievers? What if there were six atheists and they see my Bible? It's, it's just raising the odds against my son so astronomical. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to do anymore because I couldn't go without it because I, I would be just like I was when I come out of the preliminary hearing, stepping over my daughter-in-law fainted, walking into a... How do you go into a murder trial in that state of mind? I had to have it, mm -hmm. but yet they're saying no. So I went back into my prayer closet, and I said, God, this is no strange thing to you. Right. You know exactly what they've told me, because, number one, I fully believe that Satan himself knew what the outcome of this trial was going to be right there. And this was his last chance to destroy me mm -hmm. and to destroy my faith. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's a spiritual battle against your son... And my sanity was at stake. Right. A spiritual battle against your son mm -hmm. and the enemy wanted to destroy your son with or without your Bible. You're right. You know You're what I'm right. So having your Bible was for you and that was in this. favor of That was there. I See, I thought I couldn't live without it. Mm -hmm. And th thank God you Yeah, you but I went there. into my prayer closet and I started praying and God made it real clear to me. You've been telling everybody that you're going to get a miracle. You've been telling everybody that they need to get their faith up to where you're is that, that I'm going to intervene in this thing. You've told them all this stuff about taking the devices of the wicked, making them a non effect. So, what is it? You, uh, you just believe that 99%, or you believe that 100%, mm -hmm. you know? And I said, you know what? They have told us God, outside of a miracle, He's going to prison anyway. And this is what the best attorney we could find out there was telling us now, mm -hmm. not the real estate attorney. Outside of an miracle, you need to start thinking about all this other stuff, Jackie, not him going home stuff. Mm. So I said, okay, God, you know what? You're going to do it. You're going to do this. You're going to bring a miracle, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you. I'm going for it 100%. And I went right on through that medical, the metal, uh, metal detector. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Going right on into that courtroom, only thing keeping me alive, my Bible just went right on through there. Not only that, Kathy, 
During the course of this trial, that Bible was the only thing that kept me alive, alive through four days of trial. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't had it, I can't even fathom what would have gone on in there. Mm -hmm. You know, when I would, that prosecutor would get up there and just try and destroy my son, just destroy everything about his character, everything about him, and I would just want to scream out, you know that's not true. I would just look down and God would say, it's okay, it's okay. Put Thank not your you, trust in what he's saying or faith. I'm here to fence. Yes. I'm, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Just wait. It's going to be okay. Wait on me. It's going to be okay. And I would just get this peace right down inside of me. Just peace. It's going to be fine. And I want to say, too, that you put so many of those scriptures in this yeah. book that, that, will, that are such a help mm -hmm. that God will help to bring you through those dark places and how the Lord spoke to you in the word. Absolutely beautiful. Okay. Oh, yeah, but you know, okay. Our only... time is running out. Let no. me. Okay. We have to get through the yes. trial. The prosecutor is just trying to bury oh, it's your son. It's uh, but your attorney, your attorney that you got, one of the best, mm -hmm. is uh, diffusing he much of it. He don't have any hope either. <laughs> yeah. But he was. He did a pretty good job he diffusing great, much of he the. Did, uh, he did a great job. He did the best man could do. Mm -hmm. there's, not, there's not one out there that could do a better job than what he did. Mm -hmm. No, oh, he was the best. But let me tell you, what happened was, in court, truth did start unveiling. Mm -hmm. Truth did start emerging because God, it was like he struck the dominoes. And when one started falling, they all started falling. And it was like God was unveiling the truth for the wow. first time in 10 months. Truth was unveiling. Let me tell you something, Kathy. It's one thing to claim your miracle, to believe your miracle, to share what's going to happen. But it is another thing to see your miracle unfolding. Wow. It's another thing altogether. Mm -hmm. And so when that jury went out, you know, there's still, when the jury went out, there's still, the attorneys are still giving it 50 50 at best, 50 50 wow. at best, even with the wow. best that came out in court. But you know what? Did it was, your son take the stand at all? Oh, yes. And it, that wasn't my son. I, I, I looked at him and I thought, oh, oh, Lord, have mercy. He wasn't, he wasn't nervous. He was looking at every juror and he was speaking just like I'm speaking to you. And truth was just flowing. It was just flowing. Mm. And no matter how much the prosecutor tried to turn him around and, and mess up everything he said, it just flowed so the beautifully. Holy Ghost spoke through. Yeah, and when, and when he come down off that stand, I was able to call him when he got out of court. He said, Mama, I had that, that scripture in my pocket about how he was going to put his words in my mouth and cover me under the shadow of his mm. hand. It was God. It was just God. That was beautiful because uh, what you did is you cut scriptures out for everybody to hold in had their hands. To, holding onto the word. Had the 91. Okay, Jackie, um, they gave their closing remarks. Yeah. The jury was dismissed. And they and returned. Was getting, and, you know, once again, the, the doubt factor is all coming back, and the nerves are all coming back because now it's down to the wire, and this will decide whether or not my son comes home with us, and I, I still have a son. His wife still has a husband. The little boy still has a daddy. It all comes down to this. And I've sat there till I've sat anymore because it didn't come right back. We had to go home that day, and, and the next day we're up there all day, and it's not looking good. It, it's just not. And so I went out, and I, can, I just had this overwhelming desire just to pray. And I went outside the courtroom and found a bench, and I just fell down on my face in front of it. And all the true praying friends, the ones that could get prayers through, they all gathered right on, and we just started Jesus. crying out to God. I mean, right there in the courtroom, we just started yes. crying out to God, yes. help us. You have to show up. Mm -hmm. You have to help us now. The attorneys came back in from lunch and saw all this. And I know they thought, is she never going to give up on this? Is she never going to give up on oh, this? Oh, you don't <laughs> give up. You never give up. But now I know that while we was down on our faces, that's when the jury was making their verdict. And when we got back up, and no sooner than we got back in the courtroom, here they come. They reached a verdict. Mm -hmm. You see, they reached a verdict. And... I, you're sitting or standing? They come, they start moving us all around. I, I'm not anywhere I've been in before. I, I'm not in my comfort zone anymore. They put me right in the middle of the courtroom on the very front row, right behind the prosecutor. I'm sitting there, my husband and I, Jason's on this side. And they, we have to stand up, you know, and they tell us to sit down and they tell Jason to stand up. And, and he's standing there between his two attorneys and it just reminded me so much of Jesus on the cross, you know, just hanging out there. He's just hanging over a cliff. And so... They take that little piece of paper, Kathy. They take it from the this the jury booth up to the judge, and there goes our life. There it goes. That little uh. piece of paper goes our life. And you think, how can it carry so much weight? Uh. How can it carry so much weight? Mm. I, I wish I could. God would give me a book on how much weight a piece of paper that size can carry. But 
you know, I, I, I was hyperventilating now. When it got to the judge, I couldn't breathe anymore. And so I had to put my head down, and my husband, and I couldn't say a word, or they'd throw me out of there, you know, so I had my head down, and my husband was down on top of me. And when the judge read, felony murder, we the jury find you not guilty, I couldn't do anything because there were still three other counts that could send him to prison. And when they read the other, you know, the other oh. counts, and they were all five counts of not guilty, let me tell you what happened. Oh, my goodness. When I came up... I looked around, but I really didn't see anything. I just remember my hands going to the air, and all I could do was say, thank you, Jesus. For 10 minutes, nothing would come out of my mouth, but thank you. I couldn't form words. It was just, thank you, Jesus. It was just all praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What was the atmosphere in the court? When I looked around, revival had broke out, and I wasn't the <laughs> only one. There were hands and revival, but Jason and Stephanie and, and the attorneys are crying, oh. and people are praising. But the sad part of all that is the same crowd, the same media group that had portrayed my son as a murderer. They weren't there filming any of this. They followed the other side out. The prosecutor, the, the ones that were so angry, the mob, they were out there interviewing the angry mob. So once again, once the, the TV comes on saying the verdict here, you see the angry mob again. Mm -hmm. You know, you see like a, a glimpse like this of my son of a little nothing. They, mm. they, they don't capture that part. And I thought, wow, what a revival that could have broke out in America if they just got that part. Oh, <laughs> you, know? you know. But God is so good. God. And so God has good. given you the opportunity, though, to share with people right yeah. now yeah, because and another you know, time. I thought it was over. I, I, mean, I wanted my life to go on. Everybody's life had started moving on back in the right direction, but I couldn't get past it. And for two months, I couldn't get out of it, but I knew God had to keep me in it mm. so he could use me. Absolutely. The bridge between cell block A and a miracle is Psalm 91. The website is there on the screen. If you want more information about this, you can contact Jackie Carpenter and be blessed of God through this story. And we promised that we would be praying for those of you who have called this way. Many of you are experiencing the dark place in your life and needing something to hold on to. Dive into the Psalms. And God, we come to you right now thanking you for who you are thanking you that you are a great big God and that your word is real. Thanking you that we can get into your word and hold on to your word and trust your word and know that your word is unfailing. Thanking you, God, that when we are weak, you are strong and that your grace is sufficient and that your strength is made perfect in weakness. God, we thank you for it. Lord, now everyone who is called this way, everyone who is walking through dark places in their lives, everyone who doesn't know which way to turn and even those who are trying to do it themselves God even give us how to get out of the way and let your word stand because heaven and earth shall pass away but your word will stand forever and God while you work comfort those who are feeble Lord strengthen the weak put your loving arms around your people and let them know that you're there with them and that you've been there all the time and that you'll never leave them nor forsake them and for those who have called in for financial difficulties those who have called in Lord for other areas for healing in their body we pray for each one of them right now prove who you are and give us a hunger and thirst in the depths of who we are for the more of your word because it is in your word that we'll find the freedom and the victory and we thank Thank you for it today. Thank you so much for tuning in with us. I know this program has been a blessing to you, Jackie. It's been so wonderful, wonderful having you share with us. We love you and thank God for the miracle he performed in your life. And we want you to give us a call because we want to share your joy too as God performs a miracle in your life as well. We'll see you next time on Rejoice. God bless. We hope you have enjoyed Rejoice. Garth and Tina want you to be a partner in this ministry. Please send your best love gift today to TCT, P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. In Canada, please send your best love gift today to TCT, P.O. Box 1220, Fort Erie, Ontario, L2A 5Y2. This has been a TCT production.